In a country ravaged by war, a massive change is about to take place for more than three and a half thousand children being used as soldiers. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. The problem of child soldiers is essentially a human problem. It's a problem of human character, human intellect, human behavior, and human be uh, failure. No explanation in broad geopolitical or military terms or tactical terms can do justice to the facts. It is about humanity gone mad and our humaneness discarded. Many of you probably sitting in this audience today would have seen the Kony 2012 video. A hundred million people saw it just in a couple of weeks. It aroused a passion, it aroused rage and an outrage. Suddenly an issue which really remained at the periphery of our consciousness came front and center of our radar screen, our television screen. And we just wondered, how can this be going on in today's day and age? But the reality is, what you saw of Joseph Kony, the commander of the notorious Lord's Resistance Army, a man who's got the International Criminal Court warrant after him, is a microcosm of a global problem. And what makes this story of demobilization of child soldiers different? It is different, firstly, because it happened during a conflict. We didn't wait for generations of children to die or be wounded and to be lost to the fog of war. Secondly, it happened in large numbers. We couldn't afford to just do it in 10s and 20s and 30s. Thirdly, we challenged the status quo. We challenged the status quo of policy makers, of, of, of decision makers, that you need for conflicts to end before children can be demobilized. What we were able to demonstrate was, if there is a will, we will find a way. The reality is, from a suicide bomber in Iraq to a raping and pillaging child soldier in the Congo, the story is current, and so is the narrative. For me, it's a personal journey. I started my career as a Special Forces officer in the Indian Army. My interactions during counterinsurgency operations really came as a big surprise when you would meet underage combatants in combat. It's heartbreaking to see when a childhood lost and an innocence robbed when these children would, you would be confronted with would be dead or, or, or captured. Child soldiers are lethal. They are victims and they are forced into the situation that they are in. For professional soldiers, it's a, it's a moral conundrum, but a moment of hesitation out of sympathy is fatal. And for professional armies, it is one of the most demoralizing experiences. And this is something that deeply impacted me. So I left the army, and after my tenure, uh, my career in, uh, I joined the UN, and after my tenure in Bosnia-Herzegovina and in, and in um, the Iraq, I went on to work in South Sudan. And this is the map of Sudan, and this is the line that delineates the north from the south. This is where I arrived in Rumbek in June 2000. South Sudan is the size of France. It had, you heard about complexity, it was a complex emergency environment. There was a war between the North and the South, 
But there was also a devastating war which took place within the South, between the tribes, intergenerational wars, wars that had been just continuing over a period of time. When I was sent in there, my job was to look at what are the human development indicators that we could start to improve on, get children immunized, give access to clean water, give access to education. There was no infrastructure. It was as if time had paused in the south of Sudan. And you were thrown back into an anthropological journey into which you were discovering humanity from its very beginning. And it was incredible to see the large numbers of children that were actually involved in the conflict. And very quickly, we knew that as, as UNICEF, as a children's organization, we had a moral responsibility. We had, a, we had a, a humanitarian imperative to get these children out of the army. So let's look at the reasons why these children are hired in the first place. This is Ajao Deng, and Ajao Deng says, my father and mother were killed, and my two brothers were and my sister were ab abducted by the enemy. I became angry and thought I had to take up a gun to avenge them. There are issues, they're highly vulnerable, they're physically immature, they, are manip they could be easily manipulated, they're impressionable, and they're too young to resist. And in the words of Grace Michelle, the wife of President Nelson Mandela, she says some children become soldiers to protect themselves or their families. And in the face of violence and chaos around them, while others, particularly adolescents, are, are, are lured by ideology, children also identify with social causes, with religious expression, with self-determination with national liberation, or with the pursuit of political freedoms. Girls often get ignored in this entire situation. And it, 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 is, it is one of the most tragic parts that 30% of different armed groups actually employ girls who are used as wives, as mistresses, as cooks, as helpers, and as fighters. A lot of these girls are used and abused by their commanders and then handed over to their rank and file, to their soldiers as mere objects. A lot of them get impregnated, and when they go back to their communities, they're rejected there as well, having become impure. So we decided to get all the stakeholders together. We interacted with the Sudan People's Liberation Army, here and after called the SPLA, and the Sudan People's Liberation Movement, here and after called the SPLM, from teachers to community elders to tribal elders to religious leaders, and we brought all the community together inside Rumbek in South Sudan during a time of a conflict, and really went down for three days to understand, to diagnose this problem. All those issues that I talked about as regards affecting those children by this conflict, and ladies and gentlemen, it's a common denominator throughout the world, those issues that why do children become involved in conflict. And then when we were looking at the future, it appeared really grim. And it was interesting that within the ranks and officers of the SPLA that we were interacting with, we realized that South Sudan, when it became an independent country, would have a skills vacuum. There would be no youth left. There was no education left because everything was destroyed. There were no health facilities. There were no opportunities for human development. And this was the single biggest challenge that we were confronted with. So we started engaging with all the leadership uh, elements. I went and met with Commander Salva Kiir. Salva Kiir is currently the president of, of South Sudan. After months of negotiation, persuasion, really getting down to using every level of advocacy, our national staff interacting with their interlocutors at the villages, at the community level, to the community elders, right up to the highest level visits. And then this happened. Hello. Shortly afterwards, UNICEF's executive director, Carol Bellamy, visited southern Sudan and pressed the case for all children to be removed from the army. We urge that all around the world. The chief of staff, Salva Kiir, gave her a written assurance. You will get thousands of them, he said. I will assume your word is good. Within a very short period of time, you may get thousands of them. The unseen hand of destiny and various events conspired to make this really happen. This was a signed letter from the current president of South Sudan to Carol Bellamy that they would demobilize all children from their rank and file. This spurred us into action. And during this time, several things happened. Ambassador Susan Rice, who's the current US ambassador to the United Nations, was an assistant secretary of state in the Clinton administration. She came and visited South Sudan in that period, a couple of weeks before this demobilization. What we found that high level advocacy, getting senior political actors engaged, getting that message through, a consistent message, that the child 
has no place in the military. All of it really came together and began to work. And that spurred us into action. We immediately got our teams together, our national, our, our international staff of UNICEF, partnering up with the SPLM and the SPLA and going to the front lines of the conflict. That's the line, the delineating line that I showed you. And we started a process of interaction with the commanders in the field. Very hesitatingly and grudgingly, the process of, of demobilization started there. And this picture captures that one moment I was with the current defense minister of South Sudan, Majak, Commander Majak, one of the field commanders of Salva Kiir. And he said, looking at these children jump with joy makes me feel that we were doing something wrong. This was a heartwarming moment for all of us who happened to witness this. Now, for us, it was a moral conundrum. Do we leave these children there? Because the, this was the front lines of the conflict. This was the time when the dry season was approaching. And dry seasons in, in the south of Sudan used to see an exponential escalation of the conflict. The wet season, everything used to come to a standstill. Why? Simply because there was no infrastructure. There were no roads. There were no, there, there were no highways. The only constant threat was the aerial bombardment which used to take place there. So in these transit facilities, we provided them everything that actually contributes to the well-being of a child. But most importantly, was the psychosocial element that we started interacting with the children with. It was about reconnecting their childhood back to that child. You remember the picture of Ajao Deng, who you saw earlier? Look at him now. Look at the transformation. And it was like watching a baby grow up day by day. Each day, these children would, ch would, would change. For six months, we put them in Rumbek. And really, thanks to the efforts of the United Nations World Food Program, who put the logistics of the planes to get these children out, we could not have ha had succeeded in this program without the support of the International Rescue Committee, the Samaritan's Purse, and the Norwegian Refugee Council, who really stood by us through this entire operation, because this operation was controversial. It was challenging orthodoxy. It was challenging normal best practices. It had never been done before. So in a sense, it, was, it, it kind of generated a fair amount of controversy. But I have to here compliment and, and really recognize Carol Bellamy, whose leadership, whose vision, whose courage, and that of Sharad Sapra, who was the UNICEF representative there, who really stood by and trusted their staff, trusted me that we could actually go out there and deliver on a complex program, because the risks were considerable. We went back to these communities, documented each child, went back into their communities because you had to start sensitizing these communities. After six months, we had to take these children back. It, the wet season would, uh, would arrive. We had to take a, uh, and analyze what are, the psycho, what are the basic infrastructure that we needed to put in place in order for these children to go back and allow all the children of the community to be able to access health facilities and education and clean water and all those basic services that are needed for the development of a child. And this captures that moment of reunification that started to happen. <laughs> there were tears too. Look at the size of this boy. Tears are surely his right. The father says he's been in the army for two years. We provided them with skills. They were given skills of being teachers, they were given te uh, skills of being health workers, they were given skills of being, they were provided seeds and tools so that they could generate some form of food security exercise because South Sudan, as you saw from the film, was intensely food insecure. Famine used to rage frequently. There was a problem of, of, of growth of crops and agriculture simply because technology had, had bypassed it for, for, for several reasons. And this is, this is uh, Aldo Nihal Nihal, who wanted to become a teacher, and he said, lots of small boys don't go to schools, uh, so that is why I decided I, be, I want to become a teacher, so that I could help them attain a better life. Now, of those 3,551 child soldiers, some of them sadly went back to the military too. And why was that? Simply because the demobilization is one aspect of it, but then there is, the, there is the monitoring mechanism, the robustness of systems that we need to put in place, which simply we could not generate the resources and the, perhaps the donor interest to be able to do that. But clearly, there was a need that this was an important lesson learned for us. But we also had to handle the perpetrators of this conflict. These are the people that go and recruit and hire and abuse and abduct these children. But take a good look at their faces. 
these were people who've been recruited at the age of five, six, seven, eight, and nine. Those, those were the age group they were recruited in. This was the environment that they lived in. This is what their sh has shaped their temperament, their outlook to life, their approach to things. So because it had happened to them as children, this was their operating environment. They were indifferent to when they were committing exactly those same atrocities. So when you hear about these horror stories coming out of the Congo or of Colombia, think about the perpetrators. And I'm sorry if I'm sounding very simplistic here, but this is the reality. These are people, had they been demobilized in a timely manner when they were children themselves, perhaps the situation would have been completely different. My message, ladies and gentlemen, is it is possible. This is the map of the world, and there are grave violations of children taking place from the South Americas to Africa to Asia, every part of the world. Let us not forget that even in the most advanced economies, the issue of gang warfare, large number of children get abducted by gangs and used and abused at gangs. Their situation, their psychosocial situation, their turmoil is no different from that child who's abducted as a child soldier in Africa. What Kony 2012, that video did, was aroused a passion. It spurred civil society into action. Governments cannot do it alone. There are large numbers of child soldiers out there in the world. We don't, we don't get access to them because some of the places are extremely dangerous. A lot of these child soldiers become uh, adults by the time they are 18, so therefore their period served as, as child soldiers becomes invisible to us. A lot of them are killed and wounded. But moral reasons aside, there are compelling strategic arguments to get children out of the army, simply because when wars end and large numbers of demobilized child soldiers who are psychologically scarred are put back into communities, the peace is tenuous. And that we remain, need to be mindful of. And this is today the situation. Now, if you were to look at the number of children abducted by gangs and used in gangs, perhaps this map would really get full with, with red dots everywhere. For us, there is a responsibility right from national legislation. We have a responsibility to advocate at every level, starting with our local legislator, our senator, right up to the highest levels of government. What did Kony 2012 do? It spurred many senators in the US Congress into action. It, it spurred a recognition that child soldiers is an issue here. There are many Security Council resolutions protecting children in armed conflict, not enough. There has to be complete zero tolerance about the use and abuse of children in armed conflict. Our voices, your voices, everybody's voices is much stronger today. And as I said, governments can't do it alone. We have a shared responsibility in this because we have a shared responsibility in to watch our future society, our future world is going to look like. And our children represent that future. The fact that if we can have Exemplary punishment. We saw Charles Taylor on television. We saw uh, Thomas Labunga, the famous Congolese warlord who's used and abused so many children on television is a good sign. We must empower and make sure that the International Criminal Court can go after everybody fearless of rank and station, fearless of their, of their, of their level of, of development. They must be able to go after countries. They must be able to go after individuals with the full force of justice. That gives leverage to organizations such as UNICEF, such as many of the NGOs, such as other civil societies, when they engage with the perpetrators of these conflicts to say, look, leave the children out of this. Children define our future. That is where our society can be even or uneven. And in the words of John F. Kennedy, the president of the United States of America in 1963, he said, children are the world's most valuable resource and its best hope for the future. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a collective responsibility of not allowing that future to be jeopardized. Thank you.